The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Lines. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Michael Fox. Important National Assembly elections are coming up in Venezuela on December 6th, and we'll be hearing a lot about them from media both inside and outside of Venezuela. But is what we'll be hearing the full story? I speak with media analyst Joe Emmersberger about what he says is an ongoing international propaganda campaign against the Venezuelan government and what to expect in the lead up to the elections. But first, let's take a look at the latest revelations in the Ecuador Chevron case. Ecuador versus Chevron. It's a court case involving billions of dollars, a giant transnational oil company, and thousands of victims. So it's bound to invite some dubious personalities. If you ask the victims, they'll tell you Chevron and their massive team of lawyers are the villains here. A huge corporation that will stop at nothing to prevent any payout of the $9.5 billion ruling for environmental contamination in the Amazon as the result of Chevron's oil extraction activities. Chevron sees it differently. They say the bad guy here is the Ecuadorian legal system. And they say the ruling was secured fraudulently after the presiding judge in the case wrote an agreement favorable to the Ecuadorian plaintiffs for a bribe worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. In March, Chevron managed to convince U.S. Judge Lewis Kaplan that they were right, based largely on the testimony of a former Ecuadorian judge named Alberto Guerra. It now turns out that Guerra, Chevron's star witness, isn't very reliable. In transcripts released in late October of testimony given before an international tribunal on the case, Guerra admitted that he was motivated by personal financial interest and that he lied in order to better position himself in negotiations with Chevron. He also admitted that he is being paid $12,000 a month by the oil company, just short of $150,000 a year. Chevron's friends in the private media are already trying to undermine the significance of these revelations. An article in Bloomberg Business attempts to claim this is nothing new. But despite their billions, Chevron can't hide the fact that Guerra, a man being paid by the company who admittedly acted dishonest out of personal interest, should not be believed. And without Guerra, Chevron's case that the Ecuadorian ruling was fraudulently secured falls apart. If you listen to the international corporate media on Venezuela, you would probably be under the impression that Venezuela was an undemocratic country run by an authoritarian government which has silenced all voices of dissent and manipulated elections. Even the progressive U.S. presidential candidate Bernie Sanders played into this spin recently when he called late Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez a dead communist dictator. The reality could not be further from the truth, with more than a dozen free and fair referendums and local, regional and national elections held over the last decade and a half. But that is the image portrayed by the international press and even the media that is usually fairly progressive on other issues. Joe Emmersberger is a Canadian opinion writer for ZNet and Telesur. He's written extensively about international media coverage of Venezuela and particularly the Venezuelan government. Joe, thank you so much for joining me in Imaginary Lines. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Joe, you've written about what you call a remarkable propaganda campaign by the international media against the Venezuelan government over the last decade. What is this? How does it manifest itself? Well, I, I think the, the really, what makes it so remarkable is I mean, it would be very easy to pick, um, to pick right-wing media like Fox News and stuff and say, wow, look at how distorted they are and how, how much they hate a progressive government. But, it's really you have to look at the um, the liberal end, the far liberal end of the spectrum. That's why I focused a lot on the UK Guardian because they're considered an extremely liberal outlet. I mean, as far as a major corporate outlet goes, that's about as liberal as you get. And they're, you know, I've kind of quantified it at one point, uh, especially during the Rory Carroll era when he was their primary correspondent. He was producing the, the overwhelming majority of their output about Venezuela, and it was. At that time, it was at least like like well over eighty percent uh, negative. You know, it was, and uh, you know that's at the liberal end. You know, I mean, uh, another example. Uh, you know, New York Times editors. You know, they applauded the coup in two thousand two that ousted Chavez for two days. They applauded applauded that with more enthusiasm than even the Bush administration dared to do. So, 
that's what's remarkable about it. Is it really shows um, how the, over the whole spectrum, it's it's just uh, it's just uh, one way traffic. It's just totally against the uh, Venezuelan government has been for you know well over a decade. And why is this happening? Why do we see this particularly with Venezuela? Well, I think it's well, the main factor is it's, a, it's an independent government. It has a, a huge oil revenues, which give it that potential for being very independent. You know, as somebody uh, pointed out, other people have pointed out, you know, look at, consider the, the main uh, U.S. adversaries, Russia, Iran, Venezuela. I mean, what do they all have in common, right? I mean, they're all major oil exporters. You know, it's no coincidence. You know, with, with, with that oil exports comes the potential for independence, and the United States cannot abide independence, you know. Right, and there's a key piece of this, which is press freedom in Venezuela. You've written that a part of this propaganda campaign is to depict Venezuelan media as closed to anti-government views, or that the Venezuelan government has shut down all opposition media. Can you speak to this? Yeah, well, that's that's if you, if you, if, uh, if you can convince people that the opposition can't get their message out, that they have no say then it's it's a pretty short step from there to convince people that it's pretty much a dictatorship that's not really a democracy because if you can't criticize the government you know, or if you can but you don't have any access to any audience then it's pretty much a dictatorship you know that's that's the impression that's conveyed so that's a very key uh, lie basically that's been uh, promulgated all over the place well you just you just have to look at the media i mean anybody can access anybody if you speak spanish i mean you can access the media especially in the internet age you can access the media and read it yourself and it's, it's just wall-to-wall -wall opposition. I mean, there's opposition all over the place. I mean, you just look at one really good example is El Universal, because that was a, that's an outlet that uh, went through an ownership chain. And, it, you know, probably did change. It, 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 wasn't, it became less slanted against the government. But you still look at its opinion pages, and they're just, there's every day there's people blasting the government. I mean, just it's, it's constant. Anybody, can, anybody who speaks the language and has an Internet connection can go read it themselves and say, wow, this is, this is not a country where people are afraid <laughs> to say what they want about the government. You know, that's just, that's just crazy. But they've convinced people that that's the, that that's the truth. You know? Moving on, what can we expect in this media war in the lead up to the December 6th uh, National Assembly elections? Well, I just think more of the same. I mean, there's, they're not going to, I don't think they're going to be any, any, uh, any change. I mean, it's just going to, they're continue to, to depict the democratic process as, as uh, a severely deficient. They're going to, you know, they're just going to continue with that, with that same line. That's what they've been doing for, what, so, uh, they really went back to like at least 2001 when, when Chavez took a, a hard stance against the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, that's when it really seemed to it really seemed to go suddenly go all out, and that's when the, it was just all negative from from all the media internationally. There's an underlying premise, you know, behind the coverage in Venezuela. It's always that basically, we, the United States and their close allies, we're the standard. We're the real democracies, and everybody, you know, we may be flawed. You know, it's, it's, we we'll, we'll can see that we're flawed, but. We are the standard that everyone should aspire to. That seems to be the underlying premise. And sometimes, like Human Rights Watch, will just come out and say it. Like, and that's a liberal NGO. They'll come out and say the United States is the greatest proponent, a most powerful proponent of human rights. I mean, they'll just, just come right out and say it. And that's that's from the liberal extreme. You know, that's from the you know the liberal NGO. So that's it's such a closed. Uh... Joe, thanks so much for joining me on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And now on to some historical analysis of the Netflix show Narcos. Netflix's hit show Narcos has brought Colombia's war on drugs into the spotlight this year. But many accuse it of focusing on the cartels and their deeds rather than getting into the real issues beneath them. The fourth episode is largely centered around a real incident in Colombian politics, the siege of Bogota's Palace of Justice on November 6th, 1985, by the M19 rebel organization. Narcos's portrayal of the M19 group that staged the siege is misleading, painting the rebels as an unorganized, unethical, ragtag group of idealists that even turned to the CIA for help. But at least the show touches on the subject, an important yet oftentimes overlooked moment in Colombian history. Here's a bit of the background. According to an M19 statement issued the day of the attack, the aim of the siege was to convene a public trial against the government of President Belisario Betancourt for the alleged betrayal of the national will to build peace. Betancourt had attempted to end the armed conflict in Colombia during his presidency through a ceasefire and national dialogue. However, the M19 believed he had acted in bad faith.
for failing to cease military actions against Colombia's rebel groups and for not resolving the social ills that prompted the armed rebellions in the first place. The government responded to the siege with brutality and violence, shocking even the civilians inside the Palace of Justice. Armed forces entered the building in tanks, soldiers used grenades and indiscriminately fired their weapons. All told, 120 were killed, including guerrillas, soldiers, civilians, and nearly half of the Supreme Court judges. A 2005 Truth Commission would hold the M-19, the Colombian government, and the armed forces responsible. It declared the government response to be disproportionate and uninterested in the well-being of the occupants. Despite the Truth Commission, 30 years on, the reality of what happened on November 6, 1985 is still not known regardless of what a TV drama would have you believe. And that's it for today's show. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Michael Fox. Please join me next week.